Okay. Uh, well, I'll start um, with a brief introduction and um, then hand over to uh, my colleague and a student here at the iSchool. I'm Victoria Van Heining, and I am a assistant professor at the iSchool um, and a member of the Center for Archival Futures and the Recovering and Reusing Archival Data Lab. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have uh, Professor Trace Gaskin speaking with us today about her work. And um, as I say, I'll be handing over to uh, Ale Reza to introduce our, our proceedings in more detail. Um, but before I do that, I want to share in the chat and just briefly read aloud uh, from an opportunity if you're sort of feeling like, what can we do in this time of crisis and in world politics? And if you're thinking about the folks in Ukraine, um, this is a piece of information that was shared by my doctoral student, Mason Jones, who can't be with us today, um, but is also a member of CAFE and the Rad Lab. Uh, Razum for Ukraine was founded in 2014 and has since launched efforts to build a stronger democracy in the country. Um, now, according to its website, the nonprofit is focused on purchasing medical supplies for critical situations like blood loss and other tactical medicine teams. Um, and they go on to say that they're having a, a lot of um, money and support going in in um, those, those practical ways, but they're also requesting volunteers to participate in data rescue session this coming Saturday, March 5th. Uh, there are more details of the link provided. You don't need any programming experience um, to help out, and you don't need to speak Russian or Ukrainian to participate. Uh, please feel free to join in and share that with those in your networks. And I will hand over to Alia. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Great to see you all here. I'm Alia Reza. I'm a second year PhD student here at UMD's College of Information Science or Studies, when, uh, along with a lot of the folks on the call today. I am a student associated with the Center for Archival Futures, or CAFE. This is a relatively new iSchool Center. We started in January 2021. We are a group of interdisciplinary researchers from the iSchool and beyond whose work intersects at archives and digital curation. We're interested in the systems, processes, and institutions that care for and enable the use of digital objects and data over time. The various projects that fall under CAFE's umbrella take a wide range of human-centered approaches to understanding topics, including data in communities, knowledge ecosystems, and the life cycles of data. This speaker series is our flagship event and is normally held on the first Wednesday of each month during the semester. We host speakers who are at the cutting edge of archives and digital curation research and practice in a wide variety of institutions. You can find recordings of our previous illustrious guest speakers at the CAFE event page link, which should be pasted in the chat. It is now my pleasure to welcome this month's speaker, Dr. Natrice R. Gaskins. Welcome, Dr. Gaskins. Dr. Gaskins is a digital artist, academic, and cultural critic. Her work explores techno-vernacular creativity and Afrofuturism. She's also an advocate of STEAM fields, where she argues that adding the arts to traditional STEM education will open more opportunities for students of color. She uses algorithms and machine learning in her teaching, writing, and art. Dr. Gaskin served as board president of the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture and was on the board of the Community Technology Centers Network. She is currently on the board of Artisans Asylum. Dr. Gaskins is a 2021 Ford Global Fellow and the assistant director of the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University. Her book, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation is available through MIT Press. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Gaskins. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, there's some construction going on. I'm, I'm all a little self-conscious about it. It's kind of quiet, but every once in a while there may be um, some noise. So uh, hopefully it's on its way out. Um, let me share my screen. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how 
and what I mean by vernacular. Um, and it kind of starts here. Um, I started thinking about this um, for a paper I'm writing um, for a publication in learning sciences and um, it has to do with call and response participation. So here you're in, um, let me go into slideshow mode. So here, um, this is in Africa, this is the talking drum. It's our dun dun. It's an hour shaped um, device with drum heads on either side. And it was invented to imitate the rhythm and rise and fall of words in, 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 in languages. So to operate the device, a player has to squeeze the leather tension cords between their arm and their body to um, change the pitch. So historically, talking drums were used to communicate messages across distances, bringing people together, helping to settle village disputes, and serve as a memory device to help village members remember important events. So um, this idea of the talking drum has an important um, connection to how I got started in my, my area. Um, and so more importantly, as a, as a type of, of call and response participation, there's a facilitator or speaker who plays a simple rhythm and then that's echoed by, responded to by the rest of the group. Um, so uh, moving forward in time uh, in black music and especially in funk music, call and response um, is a rhythmic expectation. Every instrument is used as a drum and the ryth rhythmic pattern um, is algorithmic starting on what's called the one. Cold Sweat, and you see an album cover for one of the album covers, in this case, um, James Brown and his band. It was the first recording in which Brown calls for a drum solo, um, where he says, uh, give the drummer some. And Clyde Stubblefield um, responds. So it begins with the, it begins, it began the tradition of the rhythmic break, um, which would form the foundation of sampling, which we know in hip hop, um, or what I call uh, I refer to as reappropriation as, uh, as far as a, a TVC or techno vernacular creative mode. Um, call and response interaction enables the musicians to create entirely new music genre, in this case, funk music. Um, Pee Wee Ellis, who was on the in the band, described how the band formed a circle, laid down the main rhythm, and later James Brown would come and respond to that rhythm by having his, his vocals, the guitarist, and the drummer perform a conflicting groove. Um, so it is Cold Sweat is the first um, funk song um, ever. And it uh, really shows how they began to modify, um, you know, both, I, I kind of see the, the circle that, that, that Pee Wee Ellis describes as kind of an interface and that the way they interact is through call and response with instruments. And so I'm gonna play a little clip, um, which will require, require me to switch over to YouTube really briefly. It's a very short clip. Um, let me just do that now. And what I wanna show you is um, a very short video of him performing. Uh, let me just get back to Chrome. I always forget to hit escape um, when I'm sharing. All right. Let's go again.
So that is cold sweat. And let me get back to some reason. Um, when I stop sharing, it throws me into this kind of limbo. Um, let me get back to my slides. But I think that's really important. It was important for me, it was an aha moment when I was doing my research, um, because I realized when I looked at the description of the chorus for Cold Sweat, that the way that it was written was as an algorithm. Um, and I was really looking at algorithms and cultural artifacts, both visually and in sonically. And then when I realized that there was an algorithm that James Brown and his band was following to cre create this music on the one, um, this pattern, I realized that I was onto something um, as it related to computational thinking um, that I started to explore both as an artist and as an educator. So call and response includes um, the repetition of familiar phrases or patterns, um, reporting on something um, in a response to a call. Um, James Brown saying, you know, the things he's saying may seem kind of random, but he's actually triggering those prompts are getting this, are, are being a call and then the band will respond. And so it was actually part of that um, interaction between um, James Brown and his band um, that was really key to um, what they were doing. There's a reinforcement of an expression, um, could be a sound, could be a word, could be something else, as well as to review and solve problems based on prompts, as I mentioned. The circle or cipher is a social cultural interface for call and response interaction, creating cultural products such as quilts even, um, using electronic devices such as turntables and sound controllers to engage performers. So sampling the song, um, taking a portion of a sound from an audio track and processing it through a digital audio device such as a drum machine, um, that sample can be chopped up, looped, or arranged in an entirely new way to create a new sound. And this is an example of what I call techno vernacular creativity. Um, so the drum machine, it stores sequences of analog drum sounds or beats and allows artists to create and translate patterns into algorithms and modify, as well as allowing them to modify the devices that were created in new ways. Um, James DeWitt Yancey, AKA Jay Dilla, was known as a programmer. Um, he took a very computational approach to what he was doing with the MPC, um, which is a music production center and drum machine and sampler. He understood call and response technology and was able to replicate sonic patterns with code. Um, that includes um, the use of reappropriation, which I talked about sampling, repetition. We saw with James Brown, some of those patterns, a lot of those patterns were repeated um, and then responded to and then sort of improvised. So improvisation being the next one. This is something you find time and again, not just in African-American culture, but also in other, in the, across the African diaspora and in indigenous cultures. You move to the powwow and drumming there. Um, you kind of find this in many different non-Western cultures um, as it relates to their engagement with technology, where you expand the definition of technology to include the cipher, to include the, the idea of the interface being um, the NPC or even an interactive space of the cipher or, or circle. That being sort of where I kicked off um, my, my work in, a, in this area of, of digital media, um, HCI even in terms of human-centered um, and uh, computational thinking, comp computer science. A lot of uh, things I've been doing have been exploring this concept of call and response and um, these three, these modes that I just mentioned. Um, and as it relates to thinking about learning, there's sort of this cognitive development that happens. And um, many students who are from African-American, Latino and indigenous um, communities, they have lived experiences similar to maybe what Jay Dillow might've experienced that includes uses of STEAM concepts and applications that are different from formal methods they were taught at school. So they may be using the scientific method the way that in this case, um, in this image, Grandmaster Flash or Dilla did. Um, in the book, Dilla Time, the author talks about how Jay Dilla, because he couldn't afford um, a drum machine at the beginning, he would actually modify his cassette deck. So he was able to, to sample and produce tracks by slowing down and speeding up the, in, the inside of the cassette deck to create these looped sounds that he would then use to create demo tapes 
for his peers as well as for himself. Um, and then you have Grandmaster Flash who in his mother's kitchen um, started to tinker around with junk that he found in terms of uh, uh, electronic equipment and then eventually um, customized and modified the cross audio crossfader. Um, electrical engineering, we know that Grandmaster Flash studied electrical engineering and he was also very aware of what was happening on the streets in terms of block parties and the beginnings of hip hop. Um, product innovation, the development mm -hmm. of the audio crossfader and then social innovation where you find the cipher. And that's kind of where um, the music makes its way into the space where people are able to then perform around that, uh, the sounds that are made by these devices and this technology. Um, so these modalities, um, remixing, reappropriation, improvisation, expand what I was seeing, meaning science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, making, maker education, by connecting technical literacy, equity, and culture through TVC. Um, and that refers again to innovations produced by ethnic groups that are often overlooked. When we talk about engineering, we don't often talk about Grandmaster Flash or Jay Della even, um, but they are innovators in these areas. And these are ways that we can use to engage people who may not think we're engineering, um, that there are people that are relevant to their lives in engineering or in science and other fields and STEM and STEAM. So reappropriation is um, a cultural process by which um, uh, marginalized or underrepresented ethnic groups reclaim artifacts from dominant culture and the environment. So in this image, it's Kelvin Doe from Sierra Leone. He, just like Grandmaster Flash and maybe even Jay Dilla started to tinker around with existing things they had access to and really creating some innovations based on what they were doing. So here he's just using stuff he had hands on, whatever's at hand but he was also reappropriating and making those devices and things into something different. So it's not just taking it and using it, it's, re, um, it's sort of modifying it according to the culture in which they are living in their everyday lives. Um, we also have remixing and um, both computationally and otherwise. Um, remixing is amplified by access to computer technology whereby existing works are rearranged, combined, or remixed into a new work. So it could be a song, a section of artwork, a block of code, book, a video, or a lesson plan. And this picture, this is software I worked with um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, and um, Ron Eaglash and his graduate students on producing this, creating this um, software, this suite of tools um, inspired by artists who were kind of working in Afrofuturism and taking um, some of their works and allowing um, young people, in this case, these middle school students to be able to simulate those designs using code. So they're learning computer programming and a little bit of math, and they're able to sort of recreate the kinds of designs that are in these Afrofuturist works using software. And so block-based coding, um, similar to scratch programming. And then um, finally, the third modality being improvisation. Oops, go back. What I'm doing here is trying to move my uh, uh, Zoom tool, um, Zoom um, options. So improvisation is the spontaneous and inventive use of materials and content that elicits active engagement or participation um, from the performers. And um, improvisation is that your, your uh, example is James Brown in Cold Sweat, where he would tell his band, just go ahead and lay down the main rhythm pattern, the main groove. I'll come in later and I'll improvise on that. So he already had in his mind the way the algorithm was supposed to work, but he wanted there to be a baseline, like a bass sound that he could respond to. So that part, the coming in and spontaneously jumping in and um, understand and adding to. Um, something that's existing is an example of, of improvisation. Um, this example is, um, these uh, were uh, students in a high school in Boston um, for the arts. And these are dance students and they decided to, for their chemistry class that they wanted to create an interactive dance floor using conductive paint um, and something called a touch board, which is a microcontroller that sort of connects to as a MIDI controller to GarageBand. So when they um, hear the students dancing barefoot on this circuit, it actually plays music from the laptop. Um, so both, there's a lot of things happening in this picture. There's dance and responding to the sounds that's produced, 
when uh, the students dancing across the circuit that they painted. Um, they also did a lot of looking at the chemistry of the paint and understanding how graphite worked and then created sort of this circuit that mimicked um, what they thought was happening with the graphite, which is actually pretty correct in the way they sort of painted it. And so they're dancing around this graphite uh, sort of circuit, the way that would happen in the graphite to produce electricity. So there, there was a, a connection here that they uh, were able to go deeper um, understanding the chemistry of the electric um, conductive paint. But the whole pro process was to improvise, to respond to what was happening when stepping on the, the paint. So I came up with these, these uh, ways to describe these modalities to describe what's happening and, what's, um, and all these different examples that's in the book and, um, and, other, way, and other places. Um, the idea of breaking down a system into smaller parts is pretty common across many different cultural um, um, practices. And um, then they can be remodified, replaced, or exchanged between different systems. There's translation, so transforming dominant ideas into locally relevant and responsive de um, designs, acting on what is fixed and constant to make things that are flexible, flexible, cyclical, and dynamic, um, combining or combinations of layering and merging different um, forms and materials and sources to make new things, putting them together in such a way that each move in the work determines a, a subsequent action or response. Um, encoding, using alteration or adaptation to redeploy the material and symbolic power of cultural artifacts, embedding cultural symbols and rituals in the making process. Um, patterning, performing operations, practicing algebraic thinking, and using geometric properties such as rotation and reflection. And, uh, dilation and all the other stuff. I think I forgot to finish that line. Um, re um, repeating, uh, and so those are math concepts there. Repeating, uh, making things that perform in cyclical, cyclical or looping patterns using call and response participation. Um, so that's repetition to iterate on the existing works, um, re reiterating rhythm, interval, scale, and proportion of artifacts. Um, a lot of this is something when I'm creating um, lesson plans to work with young people or teach or to even do a teacher uh, professional development. I'm not talking about these things, uh, you know, like not being very literal, but it's embedded in my approach. So in the center image is a bio, biomechanical cyborg workshop that was in Long, Long Beach, California. And um, the students were re, um, taking existing artifacts that they thought were cool. Um, and so remixing them into creating using found objects, their own inventions using some of this, um, some of these uh, uh, methods and, um, and techniques. So let's go to the next. So a lot of that's what I talk about in the book. I give examples both from a conceptual theoretical standpoint in terms of frameworks, and then also from actual practical and on the ground examples um, from different cultures, both in the United States and in referring to stuff that's um, in other countries as well. And um, my work at um, Leslie University currently has been during the pandemic a way of taking some of the that that culturally relevant approach to making through instructables. So you see some examples of the instructables that I've done so far. There's 3D quilt codes and the Tinkercad cipher. We actually took the idea of the cipher into Tinkercad, which is um, where you do 3D modeling. And there's a way to collaborate in Tinkercad. So we worked um, for South by Southwest. We had um, educators join us in the cipher for Tinkercad and they were able to create their own um, 3D quilts um, all together in a group. So they were able to work on the same thing together at the same time virtually. Um, I talked about the chemistry and paint, um, that's a instructable. Pixel art has been really popular and are using Google spreadsheets. And um, I've done this virtually teaching young people in many different places, including in Maryland um, for, uh, for a project of using uh, pixel art and then exploring sonification because again, those pixel art, but we're using spreadsheets. So the data in those spreadsheets can actually be uh, sonic, become music. So you can bring it into another program, the spreadsheet, and use that to create uh, music um, with. So sonification. So many different ways to come at it in ways that are, can be done at home um, and uh, as well as in the classroom. And that is the educational kind of the output side of on the education classroom side of the TVC idea. Then as an artist, I want to talk about that because that has developed over the last two or three years, maybe even a little bit longer, 
Um, I started using um, something called Deep Dream. Um, and I want to be really uh, descriptive because I'm not really doing deep, using Deep Dream. Originally, um, in 2015, Google released out to the world code for something they call Deep Dream. And Deep Dream is a subset of deep learning or machine learning where it's possible to capture the content of one image and combine it with the style of another one. Um, in the early versions of Deep Dream, it was very psychedelic, almost um, you know, uh, looking like uh, you would do a portrait and it would look like if you look closely, you see dogs and cats and birds and things like that in it. Um, it's very kind of pulling from Google's data set of images to create um, a portrait. And that was the initial deep dream that got released. And then people started to develop and work with that technology and created something called neural image style transfer, which is what I use, but um, specifically deep or image style, um, deep style. And then so um, I, the way I approach it, um, is through sampling. I look actually look at hip hop as inspired the way that I use uh, um, neural image style transfer to produce images. And so the idea of sampling visual images has played a role in how I produce art, in this case, art generated by AI. So um, in this image, this is explaining the process. So there's a source image, a baseline. I talked about James Brown, he told the band to lay down a base. Uh, the baseline, a base um, track uh, that he would come and improvise with. It's very similar to that. There's a source image. And then um, I have some styles in mind. So um, in this case, there are three different styles that I was playing around with. And then I composited all three of the outputs to produce the final. Um, and this is what I was doing about a year ago. And so you can see the output of each example using this particular style and then the composite using this idea of neural image style transfer. And so, um, so now it is a totem that is uh, standing in the lobby of the Smithsonian Arts and Industries building um, as one of 11 featured futurists that I worked on um, commissioned by the Smithsonian for the futures exhibition. And so each one had its, you know, um, a particular person. There was Alexander Graham Bell, there was Helen Keller. For example, the Helen Keller image, the image styles that I, uh, for that particular image, the image styles that I used came from Helen Keller, came from Braille. Um, I used um, lace, um, um, different textures that I felt was uh, based on her time. And um, for each person, um, Floyd McKissick, it was actually the plans for Soul City that he was responsible for, as well as um, very uh, things about land and top um, and, and, and city, city planning, city um, blueprints and things like that. So, um, you know, those are up at the Smithsonian using the same idea. Um, more recently, and I know I wanna leave time for questions. Um, more recently, I have been really, really going in there with the sampling and I took on this commission to create a portrait um, I'm creating five portraits, but one of them is of Jean-Jacques Jean -Jacques Dessalines, who was the leader of the Haitian Revolution and the first ruler of an independent Haiti. The problem was that there's no photograph of Dessalines. Only previous artists imagined depictions of him. To use Deep Dream Generator, which is the tool that I use, you have to start with a source or base photograph. There has to be a base. Um, I could do a remix of the painting, but it really isn't my style. That's not what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for using something more like a photograph. So that's where I sort of looked at re looking at the TVC modes and reappropriation. I, used, I, I chose a lot of different images to create a, 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 a Dessalines um, that I could work with in Deep Dream. So you can see I used a stock photo. I used some photographs of the sort of hat that they would wear at the time. And the, co the costume is this type of uh, military outfit that he would have worn. Um, and then the, the uh, coat of arms um, from, from Haiti um, as well. And then um, I, I did several passes through the system. Um, I realized that the stock photo that I was using, his facial hair is more contemporary. And so I realized that in the paintings and all the paintings I've seen, uh, Dessalines has sideburns and they're pretty pronounced, pretty, you could really see them. So I really had to, to add on um, that in, um, 
in, in Photoshop. So you can see that I, where I was going towards and I ran a couple of passes with different types of sideburns and different approaches where the facial hair, the goatee is there. Then I took away the goatee um, and used other you know, tools to change the face even. It doesn't even look like the original face, um, but the, the output looks like that's the guy wore that clothes, had that hat, and then you can see the final, which is on the far right. And it uses the first flag of Haiti when he took, um, became a leader. Um, and in the background, almost like a selfie wall, um, but that was done post after the AI did what it does. I then go in and composite everything similar to what I talked about before. Um, this idea of, of sampling, of remixing and um, putting and reassembling things um, for these uh, images as well. This one of John Carlos from 1968 Olympics. Um, the images, the photographs I found of him have him cut off at the um, below the knee. And so there's no feet, but I know that the black socks that he wore was really important to his protest as well as taking the shoes off and the socks themselves. So I actually found a picture on Amazon of someone wearing black socks and that became uh, the socks there. So similar to the Desilines, I started to, 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 to pull from and sample from many different images to produce one. Um, Greg Tate passed away on December 7th. I did a, a portrait of him. I was doing a whole series called Gilded Series. Um, and I did one of him, his family really liked it. This is a selfie. He actually took this of himself um, at some point. And then um, Mokata, the museum, a museum in Brooklyn, um, has blown this up to over 20 feet. And now, right now, on a on a wall in downtown Brooklyn, is this 20 foot portrait uh, mural of Greg Tate pulled from the image that I created um, using the whole process of deep dream and image style transfer. So it's still AI generated art, but this time a mural on a outdoor wall. Um, there's one more thing I want to talk about as it relates to this. Um, I know it's a lot and maybe people have questions. Um, I learned um, there's sort of history behind uh, computer graphics moving all the way through back to analog photography and moving uh, back and forth in time um, in terms of how images were processed. Um, early on, when they first started messing around with color film, they would create these cards called Shirley cards and they would be calibrated to um, Shirley, um, this is someone who worked at Kodak, I believe, a secretary, and her skin was very fair. So the way they calibrated the colors was based on her skin tone. So anything that was, anybody that was darker than Shirley, much darker, the features would be lost or it would not have um, been, uh, uh, you know, an image that, a photograph that would be realistic to the person. And people ignored that for many, many years until um, uh, a wood company, a furniture company, and choc uh, a company that makes chocolate noticed that when they took used this film, it didn't look good and um, with the darker um, colors. So then when the company started complaining that the film wasn't calibrated correctly, they, re they created a, a more multicultural, broader palette um, um, in terms of calibration. So um, that carried over into computer graphics where um, they used something called subsurface scattering, which is kind of based on the Vermeer paintings from way back when with the milkmaids and the um, very soft colors kind of spread out the scattering part like marble or milk but that doesn't do well with dark skin tones um, either. And so it would, a lot of those features will be lost that are in darker skin tones. And so I started playing around with the opposite of that or shine, which is what they call specular, specular reflection. And using AI, I'm able to carry over some things um, from things like uh, tapestries with a lot of metallic or shiny type of features into the skin, into other areas of the of the, of the portrait on the output. So using Deep Dream, using the same process that I'm using like here, I was able to add specular reflection to darker skin color, darker skin tones um, and getting that kind of shine and getting that colors back in, into the images and with, um, with a lot of success. Um, so for me, I did start with the, the techno vernacular creativity in those modes, but I started thinking about it historically using AI as a way to, to, to enhance, to amplify, and to honor um, people who were not honored when they started messing around with these technologies. 
So um, I know there will be questions, so I'll stop sharing and maybe see if people have some questions based on what I've said. There's a lot, so. Patrice, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, little pre end of talk round of applause. But yeah, if anybody has a question and wants to share it in the chat, please go ahead. Um, and uh, if not, I can take the, the chair's prerogative, but I might put us on um, gallery again so we can all see each other, I hope. Has that worked? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Natrice, you touch on your um, really rich teaching experience with, um, it sounds like students from middle school on up, is that, is that right? Yes. For high school. So, thinking about us uh, here at UMD, although we have a lot of folks dialing in from um, many different institutions and none and different, um, uh, sorry, different uh, backgrounds in terms of the, the sorts of things that they study. Uh, I'm wondering if you have a good recommendation, a sort of a good starting place, maybe drawing directly from your book or your or your syllabi, um, you know, for where is a great place to start with, let's say, uh, college freshmen, you know, in a kind of a maybe a general course rather than a specific math or English or whatever. Well, let me share the screen again. There is a toolkit um, on my website. So you get access to information about the book, but I produced this toolkit to show kind of how my the framework kind of wraps around um, how you might do projects in the classroom or with students um, using those modalities and things I talked about. Um, so this one in terms of re-engineering instruments. Um, many, um, in many cultures, instruments are created from whatever's on hand. Um, so in Haiti, there's a particular way in which instruments are created, um, bringing some aspects of the, the particular culture into the making of instruments is also important. So for this particular example, looking at an example from Anas Ashanti, who created a beat jazz system, a kind of DIY project that you can find information on. And then um, this idea of using stuff from around the house to, uh, in this case, produce instruments analog versus what he does in terms of using um, 3D printed things and circuits and, and tools, software that he wears on his arm. His body becomes the controller as opposed to um, using an external controller. There's also something called purple constructionism that I uh, experienced with uh, students who wanted to create MIDI controllers who were music majors in high school. And we used, and they were really inspired by Prince particularly a song called 777-9311 by the time, which was produced by Prince, who was doing really innovative stuff with the Lynn drum machine. Um, that same Lynn, Lynn drum machine uh, technology was eventually innovated with Jay Dilla in hip hop. So um, they really went deep, not just in learning about it and listening to it and responding to it, but also making their own MIDI controllers that they could then compose music with. So that's in there too. So this idea of reinvention and modifying and creating with things that are on hand. It was a really important uh, activity that you could do with students to introduce them to things like electrical engineering or even scientific method. Um, another example was looking at hoop dancing and kinesthetics and kinetics. Um, so this idea of looking at physics to explain the relationship between motions and causes, um, hoop dancing being um, in indigenous communities, something that, um, people can look at uh, both in terms of the performance and the cultural aspects of it, as well as looking at it from a science point of view, looking at Nick Cave sound suits, which they're, uh, I created a, a, a instructable based on that, um, using an Arduino microcontroller to do what they call a photo gate on the physics side, but really looking at physics and science and the cultural product, in this case, the hoop dancing, and seeing where those those places those those two things meet is kind of um, another example. Um, and then I won't go through all of them, but this last one is looking at geometric transformations. Some of the artists that we developed software with, Sanford Biggers, his Lotus diagram. Um, we did that with the software. We have this a software tool that allows you to simulate that design. But it's all about using geometry 
And um, he also works with quilts. And so there's this whole um, idea of, of repurposing quilts that and the quilt patterns themselves that can be created using algorithms um, very similar to the polyrhythms of sound you can do with visual images. So I'm using terminology that if you're in deeply into music, you know what polyrhythms are. If, if you're a quilt maker and you're um, in G's Bend, Alabama, you know that those polyrhythms are visual and you use that to create quilts very distinctive, different from other types of quilts. Um, but this is all coming from a continuation of culture and a con continuation of experiences that are based on that culture that involve engagement with technology, engagement with math, engagement with science. It's just not called that. It's called whatever it is. Um, but this is making it very explicit and allowing students to see the connections between what's very explicit um, um, and what's not and understanding how it connects to what they need to learn as well as what they know every day. So that toolkit's available through my website. It's just a PDF. Um, so that's my answer to that. Um, an extension from the book. Um, so. Hey, thank you so much. And I think I've put the right link in the chat, but if I haven't, um, let me know and I'll try to find it. Um, our uh, wonderful collaborator is here, uh, Professor Catherine Knight Steele, um, who is our co host for this event. And Catherine, I'm wondering if you would introduce yourself quickly and, and if you uh, want to take up a question next, uh, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. I, I don't want to take up much space uh, here. I want to leave time for students and other folks who have questions for Dr. Gaskins, but thank you so much for your talk. I'm Catherine Knight Steele. I'm the director of the Black Communication and Technology Lab. I, I'll make a comment more than a question, which is to say I am enthusiastic and excited about your work uh, and the opportunities it provides for students to think about technology in different ways to open up the possibility for understanding that their own cultural expressions are deeply rooted in skill in expertise um, that so often our skill our labor is devalued that our cultural expression is devalued through the terminology that we use to describe these practices and so i am an, an exceedingly appreciative of your work um, in allowing us to reframe those conversations for scholars, for practitioners, for students. Um, and I'll just, I'll say that and I'll step back and allow folks to continue to, to ask questions. Thank you so much for your work. Sure. Yeah, then you wanna, there's a, another thing that happened today, it was actually today um, that relates to this as well. And something I learned new that's today um, I've been working with, um, I don't know if folks know the Red Hot series of records that went out in the 90s, especially um, produced really for AIDS and HIV awareness. Um, I bought the one of the Red Hot Riot, I think, whatever CD when it came out. Anyway, I now know the guy, the co-founder of Red Hot. And so we are working on a, a Sun Ra production. And Sun Ra, in terms of STEAM, he was this whole thing around myth science. He was really into creating and working, creating his own instrumentation. Um, and so I started, I learned that Sun Ra worked with some guy on something called the Outer Space Visual Communicator, uh, or the OVC. And I wrote about it somewhere. I forget where I wrote about it, but I think I read it in Yatasha Wolmeck's book on Afrofuturism. So I went deep into that and found the OVC and then his daughter, the daughter of the other guy that worked with Sun Ra read it and said, hey dad, someone's writing about it. So he contacted me and turns out his studio was where in the same city where I worked. And at one point walking distance from where I worked. So I met him and he was developing the OVC for virtual reality. But in the late 70s, in the 70s and 80s, he was collaborating with Sun Ra and, Sun Ra and his orchestra on this visual communication system that allows the, the visualization system to be the response to the music. So when I talk about call and response, they were doing that in jazz and doing that with Sun Ra. Sun Ra was right there helping to develop this invention that then eventually became a virtual reality experience. Um, but what I learned new today was very similar to something I read in Dilla Time, 
where they talked about how he really changed the way time was played back in the music. He, Dilla is known as creating his own time. So, um, and so much so that every producer from Kanye West, I actually have a video, I found video of Kanye West bowing down to Dilla. Um, so you have these people who are popular who are bowing down to this guy who died in his thirties from lupus, but he was doing what James Brown was doing with his band for Cold Sweat. He was doing with the NPC. Uh, the Music Production Center and other technology and changing time itself to produce music in a way that no one had done before. So when Bill, turns out the guy, Bill Sebastian is the guy, I met him, we collaborated, so now I know him well. I introduced him to the Red Hot folks who, and then we had a call today for the first time. And so Bill, I, I never asked him how he got to meet Sun Ra, but I do know that there's a song called Pack Jam when I was a kid from the, on the rolling rink, I remember it, but in parentheses, it says, look out for the OVC, which is, so that, that group, that rap group had to be aware of the outer space visual communicator. So as it turns out, the, the producer of that, of the Johnson crew, Maurice Starr is also the producer of a new edition and in sync, not in sync, um, New Kids on the Block. And he was a bandmate of Bill Sebastian. They were in the same band in the 70s or whatever. So now we have a connection for not just from Bill and Sun Ra, but New Edition um, and New Kids on the Block and Sun Ra and this technology, the OVC. So it just expanded and he talked about how Sun Ra would tell them to play in different time formats in the same song. Very similar to Dilla. So I was like, that information is very similar to what Dilla, so the idea of patterns Doing that all goes back to the talking drum, all goes back to polyrhythms, goes back. It may have, there was this idea that slavery, the enslavement of Africans removed culture, removed all this stuff. It just got built into the music. It got built into our cultural and creative expressions in very interesting ways, especially when we started messing around with technology that was from the West and, more, and um, commercial equipment. Um, it became very, it became innovations. Um, so Sun Ra seen as a maverick and innovator as well. Dilla was seen doing some of the same things. James Brown, same things with rhythms and patterns and algorithms. That's so good. Sure. Um, first off, Dr. Gaskins, thank you. That was such a phenomenal presentation. I think my question is two parts, and it comes from how you got us to sort of think about um, appropriation, but the sort of venue at which you showed it to us was through YouTube, right? So you you played this James Brown clip that was really, really wonderfully set up what you were saying. And I, I think that's really fascinating for a couple of reasons, right? Because we see YouTube as, as a simultaneously liberating and dangerous space, right? For the other side of algorithms, right? Like we know that YouTube can be this space where algorithms will lead you to some terrible, awful, awful content, right? Um, but it's also the space that because of the rate at which cultural heritage institutions can't keep up with preserving history, we, we have access quick. It was probably much easier for you to sort of find that example of, of the James Brown performance there, right? Um, and it makes me think about how you're utilizing that, but you're also util utilizing stock images. And, and I, I liked your example of socks that you saw on Amazon, right? And it's this sort of gray area of like, who sort of owns that content, right? And you're sort of utilizing it. And I'm, I'm wondering how you prepare students to think about both of those things, right? So how you get them to think about, you know, there are these other sort of versions of algorithms that are dangerous and bad, and we, we have to be critical of them, but also the rights you have in creation, whether it be art or just creation in general, to use the abundance of information we have in the world, right? Like, how do you how do you help folks navigate that? I don't I don't know if that's actually a formulated question, but it's just some some things that that you had me thinking about. And uh, thank you again. Sure, and we can talk about that with students. Um, did an art AI robotics class four week class last summer with high school students, um, different grades, and we introduced bias, racial bias, in algorithm as a discussion. So we played of uh, algorithmic justice league, league video. And we had them think about it, um, both a negative um, and positive. So they're doing the positive. They're making these robots using AI. They make art. 
but there's this negative so they're aware of both and can discuss um you know both as opposed to just being negative um about it um being more uh proactive about it and thinking about it maybe even addressing it in their design um but really upfront um addressing that stuff is something that um, we did and will do as it relates to ai and some of this other technology I and mean, algorithms are algorithms they're cake recipes can be an algorithm so trips either your your map to the subway can be an algorithm the step-by-step -step instructions in which you do something is an uh an algorithm and so here they're just embedded in the technology or embedded in the artwork or embedded in the music and making them more explicit helps us to better better understand how they're produced maybe even from a consumer side of things or corporate side of things I'll just, uh, I just want to jump in and, and thank you because that reminded me of your work that I cite very often about um, algorithmic patterns and braiding. And, you know, I, I write a lot about um, Black women's hair as a mechanism for thinking about digital culture and Black women's bar, uh, Black women's beauty shops as a mechanism of thinking of enclave spaces online. And so you write so brilliantly about the algorithmic uh, genius of Black women that is engaged in that braiding process. So I just, you know, taking a moment to thank you for that work because I think it's so generative for us to think about the everyday practices of our lives in these ways, um, both for ourselves, but also as a, a way of, of signaling to others, again, that notion of expertise that is deeply embedded in our cultural legacy. And we don't talk about, when we talk about reappropriation, for example, Memphis Minnie and her husband, um, wrote a song called When the Levee Breaks from 1929. The only version I know is Led Zeppelin from the 70s. They never credited Memphis Minnie and Kansas uh, McCoy. Um, so of course now the words are the exact same words. It's so the same melody, but with a rock you know, point of view. And it had to be pressure from the outside that made them start to credit Memphis Minnie. But here's a black woman in the 20s who wrote this music and there was nobody to check Led Zeppelin. Um, so it happens all the time, um, music and images. Um, so sometimes the credit is necessary when you take every single word and the melody um, and then riff on that, that's still, you should credit. Now, if you're sampling, there's a whole history of sampling. Um, we can, you know, you know, there's whole movies and documentaries about it, um, the sampling culture, but the whole idea of people, when I think of people who have been historically disempowered, um, disenfranchised and them taking what they have available, a corporation goes into a low income community and leaves a lot of trash. People take that trash and make it into something that makes them, you know, uh, create something that everybody in the world now uses like the audio crossfader. Um, we make use of necessity breeds invention and creates opportunity. And we have to look at these sort of uh, political, social political issues around the inventions that happen um, that's been going on forever. Thank you so much, Patrick, you've got your hand up. I thank you so much for your talk. This is really, really fascinating. And thank you for making this publicly available. Um, I have the privilege of teaching in the School of Music here at the University of Maryland and of directing our new Arts for All initiative, which some of you might know tries to put the arts in conversation with technology much more than it usually is. And so I was wondering if, if maybe you could muse a little bit, like if you got to invent a university, how would we get ourselves out of these silos that keep us from talking to one another across disciplines? I mean, looking at the musicians, like, you know, Coltrane was channeling Einstein when he wrote Giant Steps. Um, he produced a device that you could play Circle of Fifths to create and play Giant Steps. There are so many things we can look at that cross disciplines from, you know, I remember I first introduced, so the, the students, the music students at uh, Boston Arts Academy, knew, they all had to play or know Giant Steps but they wanted to argue with me that Einstein had nothing to do with it. And then of course I had proof of Coltrane referring to quantum physics and thinking about that when he wrote the song and they just blew their minds. They had to sit with it. It was something they weren't not because no one told them and no one talks about the connections that some of the artists like Coltrane and George Clinton and all these other people do to be innovative. I think being by looking at these examples and looking at these cross sections, these interdisciplinary connections 
is one way to inform how to create opportunities for that in the educational space. So if I'm going to produce something and maybe I do talk to a physicist or maybe I do bring in an uh, ethnomathematician or um, some other a biologist to be a part of the curriculum development or even the, um, the teaching um, to get folks to think outside the box. Any other questions? Wanting to put any of our uh, CAFE or BCAT students on the spot too much, but if y'all are here and you and you have something on your mind, please don't be shy. Um, likewise, I think we have um, a wonderful gathering of folks from beyond the University of Maryland, um, some of whom I think may be practitioners. And of course, we'd love to hear from you as well. So you're very welcome. Uh, Jessica, was that a maybe a hand going up there? No, <laughs> uh, I tried. So um, I'll give you all maybe another minute, uh, but I'll throw out something in the meantime. It, a little bit connects with something Travis was asking about, um, Natrice, and it, it's, do you find yourself turning to archival sources? I think about the work of Bisa Butler, and I know she uses a lot of black and white images that then translate into her very colorful quilts, you know, multi-layered, um, bright jewel tones like a lot of your own work um, and there's a interest for her in taking you know often unknown sort of anonymized images and giving them a life a new life and I wonder if that is a thread for you as well it really depends um, there's some images like a, a shared the desolines but it is part of a commission um, I actually shared it before I signed the contract, so I figure it's already out there. Um, but the other ones are not um, shared yet at the moment, but that's for an opera project in Boston. So these are operas um, that this, for, this is for. So there's inf I'm getting information from the musicians about what they're, um, as well as my own um, and my research. Um, the, they're doing a book cover, Harper Collins asked and commissioned me to do a book cover that is a remix. That's two different stock photos together because we couldn't find, um, without hiring a photographer, we couldn't find um, the, the right one. Um, so that that's my ability to be able to use Photoshop to make it look realistic, like that's an actual person, but the torso down and then from the from torso up are two different people um, in order to produce this teenager for this young adult book. Um, so, from, uh, but we can do that. We can hire photographers, we can go out and we can create archives. That's what stock photos are for. Um, you know, we can get stock photos and be able to start that as a base and build on. And so whether they're historical, whether they're created, you know, for iStock or something else, Getty images, but those are just the base where we go somewhere else with them. Um, there is a someone I know in France who was doing a jazz festival and they wanted to use the image I made. And I told them, I said, well, the original photograph is a high fashion photo. So now can't use it unless you get permission. They contacted the photographer of the of that photo who saw what I did, liked it, said, just credit both of us. Um, so we're both credited for that image. But they were not uh, offended by what I had done. They liked what I did. It was different than what they initially did. But the fact is most of the time that's the response I get because I'm not trying to copy. I'm trying to use it in remix. I'm trying to modify, I'm trying to, but there's also a learning thing that happens between me and the machine. Um, a lot of those images I generated for two years or so was I was just trying to learn how the algorithm worked so that I could sort of master that so I can make better decisions about what images that I chose for styles as well as for source images. So there is kind of a call and response between me and the machine. I do this, this does that, then I respond with this and we go back and forth until I get an image that I think works for whatever it is. Um, and so that's, that's an important, I think, practice that's new that um, didn't exist before. So um, yeah, it's a little different than just, that's just the st step one is the, the image for me. 
the next is the remix. The remix is the, the algorithm and the remix is the next step for me and the improvisation that happens in that. Thank you. That was a wonderful kind of call and response within your own talk. I think we wound up back with that powerful image. So um, it just remains for us to thank you again so much for your work and your generosity um, speaking with us today. A uh, big round of applause. And I also want to give you the um, impromptu award of the first cafe talk that had me dancing and I bet had pretty much everybody else dancing. So <laughs> thank you, Natrice, for that. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. It was, it was wonderful to see so many folks. The talk is going to be um, edited and then made available online on the Center for Archival Futures events page um, in the next <clears throat> couple of weeks, hopefully. And, uh, you know, I was littering our uh, chat with links. I hope you've had a chance to open a thousand tabs in your browser and that um, one of them for sure the uh, exhibition at the Smithsonian, um, you'll get to visit in real life. So again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.